Hey, Rabbi, are you, are, you, are you ready? Ready when you are. Okay, very good. Okay, okay. Bokar Tov, everybody. Nice to see you all. Uh, it's a pleasure, really. Uh, this is a little bit bit different. Uh, welcome, Rabbi you know, Joseph Jueck. I think this is the first time we're doing something with a specific, you know, a Sephardic approach. And it's a pleasure to welcome Rabbi Jueck, who is the senior rabbi of, called the S&P, but I assume the, the Spanish and Portuguese Sephardic mm -hmm. community, the United Kingdom. Um, he studied in, in Yerushalayim, got smicha from Avadja Yosef. He has a master's right. in education. He served uh, for 16 years in um, a Syrian community in, in New York, and he was the headmaster of the Barca Yeshiva in, in Brooklyn, which is the methodology I love. I, I tried, I went, to, I visited them many years ago. I wanted to have that in Toronto. They learned, they learned Tanakh basically Baal Pet through Tamei HaMikra, and anyways, he was the headmaster of school and he's been serving now very admirably and nobly, a wonderful community rabbi in London, England. And it's a pleasure to welcome him for the beginning of a three-part series on Spartac approaches to halakha, pre-enlightenment, post-enlightenment, etc. Rabbi Juak Vakasha. Rabbi Kelman, thank you so much. It's an honor and pleasure really to be able to share with everyone this morning, although I'm coming to you from Her Majesty's capital in London, so it's already afternoon for me. But um, I'm, it's a pleasure to be able to take this time to share some uh, ideas with you around um, the nature of the Enlightenment, the Haskalah, and how it is that it affected Sephardic thought, Judaism, and engagement in, uh, in life in general. So what I'm, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to say at the beginning this morning is, that firstly, I'm not a historian. And so I'm not presenting this as a historical overview. What I am aiming to do this morning, and this morning's talk, the next two will probably will be more uh, engaged in text, but this morning's talk is a bit of an overview to be able to bring us into a milieu of thought with regards to this idea. And I'm going to look at it more with you as a personal perspective and look at it in terms of culture and in terms of conceptual approaches. Um, so before I get into the actual details of what it is that I wanted to share with you to, uh, this morning, I want to speak with you a bit about my, my engagement as a Sephardi Jew with Judaism in general. So I, I have two major uh, connections as far as Sephardi Jews go. The first is that I'm Syrian. Jew. You know, I heard Rabbi Kelman speaking a little bit earlier about his family coming into Canada, uh, actually quite early, it sounded like. I was just coming in on that at, at that point. Well, my family, um, at least on my mother's side, uh, well, on both sides of my family, we originate uh, for the last 500 years in Aleppo, Syria. Uh, before that, my family is Italian and Spanish, but Aleppo has been the home of my family, both on my mother and father's side, for several centuries. But my mother's side of the family came to the United States first in 1901, my great-great-grandfather. And um, what people are not, are not necessarily aware of is that um, although many of the Middle Eastern Jews left the uh, Middle Eastern countries, their home host countries, they lived in for hundreds of years, Jews of Iraq, Jews of um, you know, uh, uh, Egypt and so on, and the, the Middle East, left very, very much because of the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948, and there was persecution that ensued as a result of that. But that is not why the Jews of uh, Aleppo originally left Aleppo when they did. They left Aleppo because the Suez Canal had opened, and while Aleppo was a major port city, the Suez Canal caused the uh, commerce in Aleppo to collapse. And so the Syrian Jews left Aleppo to seek financial uh, opportunity. And uh, because of that, the Syrian community is very business inclined, right? They are always thinking in terms of business because they are business people for generations. And my family came into the United States, again, like I said, on my mother's side from, from 1901. So on that level, although I, have, I am richly steeped in uh, Arabic culture, right? So I, you know, my family is very strongly Arabic. My my grandparents spoke Arabic. We we, you know, the foods that we eat are very Arabic. The music that I grew up listening to was very Arabic. I mean, I don't know that anybody would ever would know about uh, someone like Um Kulthum, who was 
a, a phenomenal superstar in the Arab world. I mean, the entire Arab world with a career spanning 50 years. She had a, she was a virtuoso singer. Um, and Abdul Wahab, Muhammad Abdul Wahab, who was a prolific songwriter, also extremely famous throughout the Arab world. I always find it very interesting that people can be so famous in one part of the world and completely unknown in another part of the world. But nonetheless, um, I mean, I grew up listening to their music, not only that, but their music is part of our liturgy. It's part of our prayers. We incorporated the music of Umm Kulsum and the music of Muhammad Abdul Wahab into our very tefillot. There's a story that I often tell my, my grandfather, uh, may he live and be well, my mother's father, my maternal grandfather, um, was a huge fan of Abdul Wahab's music, and I learned to enjoy it very much from him, and I later studied uh, Hazanut in that genre, which I'll tell you about in just a second, in that way, and Abdul Wahab had come to UCLA, we lived in Los Angeles, so my family originated in New York, and then they moved to Los Angeles, and I grew up, I was born and raised in Los Angeles, and um, Muhammad Abdul Wahab came to speak at UCLA, and my grandfather went to see him. And after he spoke in UCLA, my grandfather had the ability to speak with him after. And he said to him, he said, you know, I want you to know, he's telling Abdul Laham, that your songs will live forever in our prayers. And Abdul Laham looked at my grandfather and said, where's my royalties? <laughs> my, the, point of my, the point my grandfather was making, of course, was that the Jewish prayers will carry on far longer, and indeed they have. People rarely sing the songs of Abdul Wahab in Egypt anymore. It's considered classical music, but we still sing his songs every Shabbat. And at our Shabbat tables, and of course, we've put Hebrew words to them, but the tunes are still there. So that shows you something already about the nature of Sephardic culture and how it is that we engage with the world around us. So there was a very strong um, element of that in, in the Syrian community, uh, especially, in which, um, oh, thank you, I'm seeing that Mel uh, Barinholtz is telling me that we know about Um Kosum. That's lovely. And yes, Hakam Ovadia was a very big fan, which I'll tell you about in a minute, because Hakam Ovadia was, uh, was, my, was my grandfather-in-law. So, and we spoke much about, about it. So, you know, we will, we have this, this culture of listening to music. I mean, this was essentially, you know, modern pop music in, in the Arab world at the time. And the rabbis who were also very much into poetry in the Hebrew language would listen to these songs and write Hebrew words. And they would say, you know, Ma'alin Bakodesh, we go up in Kodesh and we can take these things that essentially are mundane and chol and very secular and make them holy by putting, you know, uh, Hebrew words to them that sound very similar to the Arabic words. And that was done, you know, to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of songs. And these songs ended up making its way into our prayers. And we still sing them today. So um, this was my upbringing uh, for a very long time. But remember, I said that, you know, we have been in the United States for a long time. And so for all intents and purposes, I'm a Western person and I'm a Western thinker and I grew up in Western modern society. So although I had a very strong element of Arabic uh, and Middle Eastern culture, right, Jewish culture, uh, I was not of that place. I never saw Aleppo in my entire life. I only heard about it. But uh, so while the customs were very much strong in my, in my family and in my own life, um, the experience of my waking days was Western. Uh, when I when I turned 39, when I, at, at age 39, not when I turned 39, but at age 39, I was appointed as a senior rabbi of the Spanish and Portuguese Sephardi community here in the United Kingdom. Uh, and I live now in London with my family. Um, and I'll tell you a bit about that, right? Because it's going to have to do with what it is that we look at today. The Spanish and Portuguese community, and I see that there are questions coming up here, so I'll pause every now and then to see what we've got, but essentially I'll look at the questions if it's all right with everyone at the end, and I'll, I'll leave some time at the end to be able to answer some of the questions. So we'll do probably about 45 minutes of, of talk, and I'll look and I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Um, but the reality is that uh, here in London, the Spanish and Portuguese community is the oldest Jewish community in the country. So before they were admitted, the last Jews that lived in England were, uh, you know, uh, thrown out by Edward I in the 12th century, and until then, 13th century, and until then, until 1656, there had been essentially no overt Jews. 
living as a community in England. And the Spanish and Portuguese Jews who had fled Spain and Portugal as a result of the, of the, uh, the inquisitions um, ended up in Amsterdam. Many of them ended up in Amsterdam, not all of them. Many of them, as you, will, as you know, traveled throughout the Mediterranean basin and into the Middle East and North Africa. But there was an element of the Spanish and Portuguese Jews that remained in the West. And they came into Amsterdam. And in 1656, the head of the community um, uh, came to uh, Oliver Cromwell, wrote a letter to Oliver Cromwell, because at the time they had overthrown the monarchy and our, Oliver Cromwell was the Lord Protector. And they petitioned him um, to allow for the Jews of Amsterdam or an asp some of the Jews of Amsterdam to come and live in um, London. And Oliver Cromwell did not decline to allow for the Jews to come and live, the, the Jews from Amsterdam to come and live in London. And they did in 1656. And they established publicly a, a Jewish community here in the city of London. So I don't know if anybody knows London, but the city proper, what we call the city is one square mile, it's old London. And they established a synagogue on Cree Church Lane. And they prayed there until 1701 when they had constructed uh, after the great fire, um, in 1701, they constructed the synagogue that we call Bevis Marx, and it's called Bevis Marx because it is built on Bevis Marx Street. Bevis Marx still stands today. It is the oldest continuously used synagogue in the entire world, as far as we know. We don't know of another synagogue that has been continuously used without cessation for 300, over 300 years. So Bevis Marx opened its doors in 1701, and it still remains in service today uh, and is still lit by candlelight, incidentally. But it is one of our, it is one of our synagogues. And it was built as a, a small replica of the Esnoga, the great uh, synagogue of the Sephardim in Amsterdam, um, that was essentially seen as the, mother, as the mother community. But what is important about our community, besides it being the oldest community in this country and therefore the establishment. I'll tell you also, very interestingly, I want to say, um, I didn't say it at the beginning, but I do want to say it now. I'd like for this, this talk to be for Rifuah Shirema, for my dear friend and, uh, and mentor, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, um, and also for uh, Diane Hanuch Erentroy, who is uh, the, the head Diane of, our, of, of London. Uh, who unfortunately is very ill and in intensive care. Um, but I want to tell you something that Diane Ehrentroy told me when I came to London. Diane Ehrentroy um, said, you know, Rabbi Dweck, uh, we, so when we fill our get, when we write our get in the Beit Din, this is an Ashkenazi community. This is, and this is Diane Ehrentroy is the head of the Ashkenazi community. He says, we spell London on the Thames River, which is what you're supposed to write in the Get, right? So that we know that it's, it's this London and not some other London that it's situated on the Thames. We spell London and Thames in the Sephardic fashion, not the way the Ashkenazim would normally write it in London. And I said, why is that? And he said, because it's the Minhag HaMakom, because it's the custom of the city, that when we arrived here almost 100 years after the Spanish and Portuguese Jews arrived, they had already been established. My Bet Din uh, that I oversee as the senior rabbi of this community is the oldest Bet Din in the country. Uh, and it's been running for over 350 years. And so he said, we in our Bet Din, the Ashkenazi Bet Din, we spell Londres, right? Lamed Vav Nun Daled Resh Samech, as the way the Sfaradim said. And the Thames, we spell the Thames. Uh, doesn't, doesn't matter how we spell it. But in any case, they spell it according to the Sfaradim, like the Sfaradim. And I just thought that it was remarkable. And it's the rarest of things. You don't hear that very often, you know, little tidbits like that, or how it is that, you know, communities who have been intact. And the, the British community is, is, is unique also in that um, it was not, thankfully, it was not, it was not ravaged um, by the Holocaust in the way that the rest of Europe was and where entire communities, Rahman al Islam, were lost. Um, and so there's something very special about the community here in London, certainly the Sephardic community here in London. Um, but the point that I think is essential for our, for our discussion today is that it is a Western Sephardic community, which means that it had very little, if any, influence of Middle Eastern culture. They were situated in the West. 
There was a strong connection to Italy. So the first rabbi, my predecessor, uh, when I say predecessor, I'm talking about 1701, who was the, the, the first rav of the Bebis Mark synagogue and essentially the community and the Av Bedin was Hacham David Nieto. Hacham David Nieto was born in Leghorn, Italy. And he came to London from Italy and he was a polymath. He was, in, he was a physician. He was a scientist and mathematician. He was uh, a tremendous orator. And, um, and he came from, from Italy to be the Rav here in London. Um, and we'll speak more about him in just a bit. But it is important to recognize that there is a different kind of Sephardi, right? That there is this thing that, that, that we call the Western Sephardi. And I'm gonna talk more about that in our third lecture, if you're still around by, that, by the time that we get to our third lecture. Um, what is unique about the Western Sephardim, but I want to talk about it today more in terms of contrast. I want to talk about it today more in terms of how it is that the enlightenment affected Judaism and how it is that that fell or how it is that it landed among the Sephardim, both in the East and in the West. Um, and so what we have to recognize is that in general, the enlightenment is quite complex, the Haskalah, you know, if we're going to talk about the Jewish version of it, right, it's quite complex, it, affect, it manifested, I'm sure that I'm speaking, you know, things that you already know, but just for our own orientation, it manifested in different places at different times in different ways, and there were different responses. But what essentially is core about it and important about it is that it shook the Jewish world in various ways, because essentially it was touching in, in Europe communities that were not necessarily used to thinking and experiencing the world through the lens of the outside. Now, when I say that I understand that I'm making a sweeping statement, I'm making a generalization, and of course, that even in uh, Europe and Germany and in France, uh, more so than perhaps in Eastern Europe, there was there were it wasn't that there wasn't any interaction with the outside world. It wasn't that there wasn't any interaction with the secular. But for all intents and purposes, there was tremendous focus on Torah. What was studied was specifically Torah, and how it is that Torah uh, filled the lives of the Jewish people. The rabbi was the most important and influential speaker and thinker of the Jewish community in Europe. And what that meant was that it's not just that there was an exposure of the secular with the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was unique because the nature of the secular was starting to shake and rupture the known world. Forget about the Jewish world. It was just shaking and dismantling the structures of reality that the, that the old world had come to know. And so what it's bringing to us is elements, questions of philosophy and science that are starting to remodel the way that we see reality. And when I say we, I mean human beings in the West see reality. We are no longer seeing reality in just, you know, Aristotelian terms or, or you know, in, in the older terms that, that, uh, that people had been, been accustomed. And more than that, there was a, a certain freedom that came as a result of the enlightenment. And what I mean by that is there were very clear um, positions for human beings in the West uh, before the enlightenment. I mean, there was, there was a very clear, uh, you know, uh, feudal system. There was a clear position that every person kind of had in the Catholic world, which was, you know, dominant in the world at the time. Um, and people had a, a sense of what the meaning of life was. They had a sense of their place in the church. They had a sense of their theological beliefs and understandings. They knew who they were in society, more or less for all intents and purposes. And the enlightenment just dismantled all of that because it challenged all of that. And I think it's very close to what it is that we're experiencing today, which um, I'll leave for now, but we, I, I believe that we are experiencing something um, much more fundamental perhaps than people give, uh, give credit to. And, and that is that I believe, again, that all of the systems that we had been accustomed to for the last uh, you know, few hundred years are completely changing. And I'm speaking only in sweeping terms now because I'm sensitive to time, but if you think about it, right, the institutions that we, uh, and when I say we, I mean, I'm, I'm 45 now, and I'm talking about my childhood, right? And so I'm, I'm, 
assuming that the majority of the of the of the audience uh, listening this morning will remember a very different type of world and where institutions were central in our world and where our banks and our libraries even the way i mean let's use that as an as as an example shall we let's let's use that as an as an example i mean you know you remember libraries right you remember those yeah uh, few people do anymore today, but even if I were to ask you, I mean, COVID aside, yeah, most of us don't visit libraries the way that we used to, yeah? I mean, we may do it for leisure, but, you know, to talk to anybody uh, under the age of 25 and speak to them about a world before Google is unfathomable to them. They don't understand what it is that this means, that there should be anything before Google. And, you know, it's nice to say that, but let's think about what the ramifications are of that. If I had to do a report in school, or if I had to uh, find information, I had to go to the library to find that information. And it was the most impossible thing to do. Not that, you know, we weren't used to it. And, you know, thank God for the Dewey Decimal System. But the bottom line is that we had to really, rum we had to really rummage to be able to find the bits of information that we wanted. You know, you know what the experience was. Shall we reminisce for a minute? I mean, you have to go in. I'm talking about before the computers were in the, the libraries. Well, you had to actually go to the card catalog, right? And pull out this long drawer and find your a card that represented a book that you were looking for. And then you had to find where that representation was on the physical shelf and go and find that book on the physical shelf, which was never there, by the way. It was never there. But if you had the good fortune of finding the book actually be there, you then had to open the book and look through the chapters of the book and figure out which chapters would be most pertinent to the particular bit of of information that you were looking for. And then you would be have to glean the information from those chapters in order to be able to get what it is that you were searching for. And today, you Google it. And you say, well, I mean, you know, there are qualities involved. Yes, there's a whole bunch of differences that involved, that's involved. One of the major differences is that context is no longer important. We are growing up in a world in which context is completely falling away. Remember that there is much unspoken in a library that is presented to you, perhaps more, more accurately is presented at you, and where the context for the information that you search is already determined by someone else. Dewey decided where that book should be, how that book should be categorized. The author decided how exactly he wanted the bit of information that he presented, she presented to you, how it how it should be how it should be uh, engaged or how it should be you know embedded in the contextual and conceptual presentation of the ideas. Googling something strips away information strips away context, and our world is a world that is growing out of objective context. Everything is about what it means to me, and what I'd like to see it as. And there's more that we could talk about with regards to that, but that's not what today's lecture is about. I'm simply presenting that as an example of a completely changing structure of society that you and I did not grow up with. And that our children and our grandchildren don't even know. So enlightenment did this to the world. And it completely dismantled the way that, that uh, society related to a world, looked at a world. One of the most significant things that it did was it questioned the entire validity of religion. And so that was a major, major issue that Jews in the West had to deal with. That Jews in the West had to deal with. Yes, I see Tova, Google, does suggest context differently, but it's precisely that it suggests it. And it all depends on your searches, because what I search for on Google, you search for one thing on Google, and I search for the exact same thing on Google, what comes up is going to be different, very likely, depending on our search history, because it's a heuristic. It learns from our previous engagement and, and surfing as to how I think and what I look for. It is extremely personalized. But again, I'm going to leave that now, but thank you for that point.
And so if I recognize that religion itself was this being, being seriously questioned, where the foundations of religion, which were unquestionable for so long, were, were shaking under the feet of Western society, well, of course, it's going to be a major issue for the Jewish people who are living in the West. And they're going to have to deal with it. And like I said, different communities, sections of the Jewish world in the West dealt with it in different ways. But what, what we sometimes do not realize is that the Middle Eastern North African Sephardic Jews, right, except for those perhaps who came into contact with the French, and there was a bit of that there, the Allianz and so on, but quite limited, were for all intents and purposes untouched by the Enlightenment. They didn't experience the, the, the tremors. I'll go so far as to use the word, the ravages of the Enlightenment. They didn't experience it. And that has two effects. One, it means that they didn't have to deal with the challenges. They carried on with their study and their investment in Torah thought. And, and they, that meant, I mean, just to give it a bit of a, of a broader sense, right? That meant that they could sit and study Torah alone they could engage their, what we would call their chidushim, right? Their, their innovations in Torah entirely contained within their Torah texts without having to really worry about what was going on in secular society. It was all self-contained. So that was one thing that continued in the, in the Middle Eastern Sephardic world up until very recently. Yeah, we'll talk more about that in the second, in the second lecture, but that carried on. But what it also meant was that they didn't have to respond to a profound development of the Western world, a development that we will never go back to. We will never go back to see what was before. It fundamentally changed the world. And the Western world moved forward in that direction and became dominant as a result of that massive change that the Enlightenment caused. And so that also meant that the Sephardic Jews were lacking as a result of not having to respond to the challenge of enlightenment. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Now, before I do, I, I want to tell a story, tell you a story involving Rav Ovadio Yosef, right? And um, Rav Simcha Wasserman. Rab Simcha Wasserman was the son of Rabbi Hanan Wasserman. Rabbi Hanan Wasserman was a Talmud Muvhak, was a Talmud of the Chafetz Chaim, right? And uh, growing up in Los Angeles, you know, we all heard, I, I, I never met him personally, but, you know, my, my uncles did, my grandparents did, of course, because Rab Simcha was, was uh, almost single handedly responsible for Torah in Los Angeles. He lived in Los Angeles. And so he, was the founder, really, of Yiddishkeit in Los Angeles, Rav Simcha. And uh, this story was told to me by Dr. David Fox, may he, may he be well, a close friend of mine, who now still lives in Los Angeles. And Dr. David Fox uh, was a Talmud of Rav Simcha. And so he heard this story firsthand because he was sitting at the table uh, when it happened. And... Um, um, Rav Zalman Uri, I don't know if any of you know him or have heard of him, but Rav Zalman Uri was the head of the, um, the uh, Bureau for, Edu for Jewish Education in Los Angeles. And uh, I remember Rabbi Uri. Rav, Rav Uri was um, sitting next to Rav Simcha at a Malave Malka. The Malave Malka was in 1975, the year that I was born. And it was a Malave Malka that Rav Simcha had given for Rav Avadja Yosef because Rabbi Vajja had come to visit Los Angeles for the first time after he had become Rishon Sion, chief rabbi of Israel. And so sitting at the table was Rab Simcha, Rabbi Vajja Yosef, and next to Rab Simcha was Rabbi Uri. Rabbi Uri. And uh, all night long, uh, during the Malava Malka, people were coming up to Hacham Ovadia and asking him questions Right from all all sectors of Jewish law. Right now, I I hope that I don't have to tell you. I'm sure you know this already. But but 
Rabbi Vajra Yosef was an unmatched posik. I mean, when an unmatched Jewish legal mind, you know, perhaps for the last 200 years, uh, if or nothing else, his knowledge of everything that was written under the sun that he read and did not forget. But he also was a master of the law, right? He understood the law. He was a master of the law. And he had the law on his fingertips in a way that I, 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 unmatched. And so people were coming and asking him questions all over the place. And he was answering. He was answering, answering, answering the questions. And Ravuri says to Rab Simcha, he says, how is it that he's answering these questions so easily and so casually without any shaklevetaria, right? Without any discussion, without any peel pool, without any delving into the issues. He just gives out the answers as if they're matter of fact. Why am I telling you the story? Because of the answer that Rab Simcha gave to Rav Uri. What Rab Simcha said to Rav Uri was, he never had to sharpen his knife on the grindstone of Haskalah. That was his answer. And what essentially that meant was that the, the, the intellectual calisthenics that enlightenment required of Western Jewry, right? What it forced Western Jewry to engage in, Rabbi Vajja, for all intents and purposes, didn't deal with. And that's Rabbi Vajja, right? That's 20th century. And that was because Rabbi Vajja Yosef, who was typical of many of the Sephardim, the Middle Eastern, he was Iraqi, but he moved from Iraq to Israel when he was four years old. Who He went to Yeshivat Porat Yosef. He studied in Yeshivat Porat Yosef in Yerushalayim, famous yeshiva. It was typical of him and all of the Torah scholars of his day and the Jews for that matter of his day and his time and everybody who came before him in that region that they did not have to expose themselves to Western thought. They could have, you might even say they should have, but they didn't have to because in their world, it continued to move along as if nothing had changed. And so Rabbi Vajra, he gave beautiful drashot Beautiful drashot, but his drashot did not incorporate philosophy, didn't incorporate psychology, at least not in the way that we understand it and look at it today. And they were, and I'm saying this, he was my grandfather-in-law. I, I, I got smicha from him. I, you know, I, he, he, I, I look at him as, as, as the, the greatest Torah scholar in the last 200 years. But he didn't have haskalah. And his Torah didn't taste of it, didn't have any essence of it. And because of that, because of that, I'm sorry to say, there was a bit of a ridicule by the Western Jews, and the Ashkenazim are not the only Western Jews, but the Ashkenazim did. There was a bit of, there was a bit of a sense of inferiority as a result of it. Now, on a social level, I think that's entirely inappropriate. On a politically correct level, I think that's entirely inappropriate. But there was a grain of truth in it. The grain of truth was that there was a sense that there was a certain element of sophistication. There was a certain element of depth. There was a certain element of enlightenment, if you will, that was missing in the taste of the Torah of Rabbi Vajra. Even in the argumentation, even in the presentation of law that was so clean for him, so matter of fact for him, that his knife didn't have to be sharpened on the grindstone of Haskalah. But it was felt, the fact that his knife had not been sharpened on the grindstone of Haskalah was not only felt in his legal presentations, but in his agadic presentations. They were beautiful. They were simple, elegant, but they lacked a certain intricacy, depth, and philosophy. You could not compare a drasha of Rav Avadya Yosef to the writings, for example, of Rav Yonatan Aibshitz. You, you could not compare the way that, that ideas are dealt with, the philosophies that are just inherently known in the presentation of thought, and that unfortunately, fortunately, whatever have you, I don't want to give a value to it. But if I'm looking at it objectively, it changes everything. 
Now, I will say, as I, as I mentioned, that don't forget that there are also other Western Jews, that Ashkenazim are not the only ones. There are Western Sephardim. My community here in London can trace back, the community itself, right, has always been in the West. I go so far as to cheekily say that the sun has never set on the Spanish and Portuguese Jews of England. What I mean by that is that for all intents and purposes, they were always in the Enlightenment. If you go all the way back to the Rambam, they were in Spain, and then from Spain, they went to Amsterdam. Amsterdam, remember, in Amsterdam. So when I say, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, the thought of Sephardic Jews, you think when I say Sephardic Jews, Middle Eastern Jews, that's your automatic, I would bet, you know, I'm, I'm assuming here, but I bet, right, that your automatic assumption is you think uh, Sephardim of the East, turban wearers, you know, robes and you know all that kind of stuff but i told you about hacham david nieto for example hacham david nieto like i told you was a polymath he lived in the 17th century later 18th 17th 18th century i'll tell you i'll read for you what heinrich Graetz writes about him yeah um all right let me bring this up. Give me. Heinrich Greitz, of course, this story, and he was once Talmud of Shamshin Rafael Hirsch, but there's a whole story there that we won't get into. So Heinrich Greitz, in his history uh, of, of the Jews, he writes that about the 16th and 17th centuries of Judaism, he says there was hardly a person commanding respect who could worthily represent Judaism. Uh, that was his own idea, right? Perhaps people might argue there were certain, there were you know, important rabbis at the time, but he says few rabbis occupied themselves with any branch of study beyond the Talmud or entered a new path in this study, right? There's another thing. The exceptions can be counted. Rabbi David Nieto of London was a man of culture. He was a physician, understood mathematics, was sufficiently able to defend Judaism against calumnies and wrote much that was reasonable. I know also that he was a strongly embraced Newtonian physics and that he engaged in discourse with the Archbishop of Canterbury about these issues. Nobody talks about him. When I say nobody, of course, I'm also exaggerating. But what I mean, it's not in the vernacular. It isn't in the mainstream of Jewish thought. Or for that matter, not only David Nieto. So David Nieto wrote a book, for example, called Matedan. Matedan, he called the Kuzari Sheni, the second Kuzari because he essentially had a congregation that were all Christian conversos, Catholic conversos. So they had no problem with the five books of Moses, but they had a huge problem with rabbinic Jewish law. And so David Nieto had to teach them the values of rabbinic law, but what he used was their philosophical ideas and thinking in order to be able to do that in his book, Matedan. In Amsterdam, just a generation before, People like Hacham Shaul Mortera. Hacham Shaul Mortera was the Rebbe of Spinoza. Hacham Shaul Mortera was a brilliant thinker, and he published, among other books, one of my favorites, a book called Givat Shaul. And in his Givat Shaul, he has hundreds of sermons that he wrote. Read those sermons. Those sermons are not written by an Eastern mind that has not touched the Enlightenment. Those sermons are written, written by a Western mind that is immersed in the Enlightenment that talks in terms of the philosophies that were opening up in the day, that people were immersing themselves in the day. They had to deal with Immanuel Kant. And that's very, very different than living in a place and where you can, oh, you may, you may be reading, you know, the poetry of Rumi or something. That was what was different. And that changes everything. And so I'm not speaking to you this morning about the ramifications of all of this. Again, like I said, what I'd like to do with you this morning is simply present the playing field. What's going on? Next time, and I'm not ending now, I'm just telling you that next time, I want to look at the ramifications. I'd like to look at what actually happened and to look at it from our own perspective, how it is that we see life and understand how it is that it affected us. And us, I mean all of us, all of us.
So when we realize that, you know, people like Hacham Shaul Murtera, when we realize that people like Hacham David Nieto are living in the West and thinking in the West and writing their Torah in the West, they cannot help. There are those among, there are those in the West that are doing this consciously, right? That, that, that are reading philosophy, that are reading the sciences, that are understanding their world through these new lenses that are presented and then understanding their Torah within that understanding, from within that new learning and trying to understand how does the Torah speaks to these things. And I want to share with you how it is that they do this, because I mean, this is a major question again, that, that because of the time we're doing everything in broad strokes, right? So you'll forgive me for that. I mean, you know, if we had a much longer time and we were going through much more intricate, intricate elements and we could of course, uh, you know, talk more about this. I'm loving that people are giving me little tidbits on Chacham David Nieto and so on and so forth. So it's wonderful to hear that everybody's, you know, uh, responding to these things. Thank you for that. But what I want to point out, you know, we can talk about Torah and its relationship to secular knowledge and so on and so forth in many different ways. And it's a massive topic. But what I want to say, as far as at least as far as the Sfaradim were concerned, was that they looked at Torah as a framework. They looked at Torah as a lens. They looked at Torah as it is stated, a kli chemda, a vessel, a precious vessel through which they understood the world. So what the Torah was for a person like Hakam David Nieto, what the Torah was for a person like Ham Shaul Mortera, incidentally, I told you that Ham Shaul Mortera was the Rebbe of Spinoza. And that as enlightened, and he excommunicated Spinoza. I mean, I officially, just you know, it's a funny tidbit of information, just so that you know, I, uh, till this day, I'm not really allowed to speak about Spinoza from the pulpit. The, the ban is still intact. Yeah, in the Spanish and Portuguese communities, because he was put in the ban, under the ban. But I remember Rabbi Mark Angel uh, saying in a, in, a, in a lecture that he strongly believed that if he had an opportunity to have a conversation with Spinoza, Spinoza would not have left Judaism. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. Nobody knows, but it's a nice statement to make. The bottom line is Mortera was not capable. With all of the enlightenment and depth and breadth that Mortera had in a Western world that was evident in his beautiful and thoughtful sermons, he couldn't deal with Spinoza. He didn't know how to deal with Spinoza from the perspective of Torah. And so he lost Spinoza. And that's not a criticism, it's simply an observation. And for Rabbi Angel to say, I believe if I would have spoken to Spinoza, I would have kept him in Judaism. I don't think that's an outlandish statement because obviously Rabbi Angel has some 400 years to be able to deal with it, to think through, to understand how it is that our Torah might deal with the ideas of Spinoza. But the ideas of the Sfaradim, the way the Sfaradim have always looked at it, is that the Torah is a framework, is a lens through which we understand the world. And that as I used to say to my teachers and to my students and to the parents of the school for which I was a headmaster, the author of the Torah is the author of the world. And there are no contradictions. If there are any problems that we find between the two, it's our issue to figure it out. Certainly, if we are talking about Orthodox Judaism and we believe that God wrote the Torah, I mean, you know, this world that he created, I mean, that, is that how we start the book? Saying how he created the world? So are we going to expect that the world that he created is not an expression of his? Well, that was a major difference between Sfaradim and Ashkenazim for a very long time. And again, I'm speaking in, in generalizations and I understand and I acknowledge fully that there are exceptions to these generalizations that I'm saying. But in general, there was a strong aspect, element of Ashkenazi Judaism, of Ashkenazi Jewry, of Ashkenazi scholarship, of Ashkenazi Torah, that saw the world that God created not as an elaborate expression, but as an elaborate distraction from Torah. And that it was a challenge to us to live in the world and still maintain our focus on Torah and mitzvot and not be 
enticed away by it. The alternative to that is that the world is an elaborate expression of God. And that it is through that world that I come to know him. Famously written, not in the Enlightenment, but by Maimonides. Who one might say lived in an earlier Enlightenment. But of course, I acknowledge that the experience of Al-Ghazali in the 12th century is not the same as experiencing Immanuel Kant during the time of the Enlightenment. Nonetheless, those questions are questions that run very much in the issues that we're dealing with. So is it possible that if you have your rules, why was I saying that the sun never set on the Spanish Portuguese community? Again, I'm saying it in a cheeky way, but there is a grain of truth in it. And that is that if you trace it all the way back to Maimonides, there was always a foot that the Western Sephardic Jews had in enlightened secular thought and were trained to incorporate that into the framework they had of Torah. So even though greats does not include, for example, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Luzato in the rabbis that he thought were significant in the age of the 17th and 18th century, I point out all the time, you look at the Derech Hashem of Rabbi Moshe Chaim Luzato, and you realize that that is not a man that is living in the East. He is presenting philosophy of Judaism in terms of a Western thought thinker. He's presenting it in very succinct and clear logical progressions. He's talking in ways that nobody, of his, none of his contemporaries in the East even began to think to do, had the capacity to do. Not to mention the fact it was something that people don't know about Ramchal. He was a playwright. He was in Padua, Italy. You know, I mean, of course, you know, the whole, the whole uh, you know, scandal, unfortunately, that he went through in his life. Died very, very young, 39 years old. But he was a playwright. He wrote three, three, yes, he was. When I say Sephardic, whoever it is that's B, period, when I say Sephardic, I'm not talking about that he came from Spain per se. I'm saying he wasn't Ashkenazic. He was a Western Sephardi. His approach, his thought, his liturgy was Sephardic. He was not Ashkenazic but I'm not gonna get into an argument now. And so Rabbi Moshe Haim Luzato, who was born in Padua, who ended up in Amsterdam in the Spanish and Portuguese community. Yeah, I'd love to see it, thank you. Who ended up in the Spanish and Portuguese community, wrote three morality plays in his lifetime. He used the mode that was in vogue at the time to be able to communicate his Torah. That, was a tremendous, tremendous influence of the West and the Enlightenment and the changing of culture. So I'm going to stop here and I'm going to answer questions, but I'm going to say this. Well, what happens then to the Sephardi Jews that are in the East that are not touched by the Enlightenment? That for, for generations after, carry on as they are, and then all of a sudden, and then all of a sudden have to come into the West and meet their Ashkenazi brothers and sisters that have been in the West for a thousand years. And when I say the West, I mean even Europe. There, you cannot compare coming into the United States of America from Germany and even Poland to coming to the United States of America from Iraq and Syria, not comparable. And that's what has to happen. And so what I want to do is talk about that next time. What happens when that occurs? When somebody even like Rabbi Vajah Yosef is sitting next to somebody like Simcha Wasim and Simcha, what Rabbi Simcha has to say, he, just, he never sharpened his knife on the grindstone of Haskala. Well, how does, that, how does that interaction happen? And even when they come into Eretz Israel and the founders of the state are Ashkenazi Jews, what happens to the Sephardim that don't know from the things that they know about? What happens to those feelings and interactions? Is there a self-consciousness that occurs? Is there a feeling of inadequacy that occurs? Perhaps. Perhaps.
Maybe it means that we need to start dressing differently, speaking differently. Maybe the way that we've studied in our yeshiva doesn't work for us anymore. And of course, there's always that little quiet unspoken enclave called Spanish and Portuguese Jews that carry on their life you know, <laughs> happily that nobody really knows very much about, right? It's not really prominent because they're a minority and a minority and a minority. Well, they've been in the West a very long time and been doing things very differently. And so we have to look at how it is that they've manifested. And we will do that, please God, in the next two lectures. So I'm very happy to uh, kind of read through these a little bit and to hear any questions if I'm capable of answering that people, uh, that people have. Let's take a look here. If, you, if I can, I mean, is that all right? I'll take a look at these yeah, as we're going through. Yeah. Um, Ovadi Yosef made a joke about the Arabic background to Sephardic liturgy. Yeah, he was an expert at that wordplay. He loved the wordplay. Always did, always did a great deal of that. Isnoga in Amsterdam is also candlelit. Yes, I know it is. I know it is. It's beautiful. Are there any documents composed by Menashe ben Israel, who was the one who petitioned uh, Oliver Cromwell and Bevis Marks from the British Library? Yes, we do, actually. We have the original documents that are signed by Menashe ben Israel um, here in London. Our prayers liturgy may not, be, may not change much, but the interpretation of it does change, often radically. Example, Amalek is often interpreted as within us rather than literally or the sacrifices. Of course, and that's how we would expect things should, should develop, shouldn't it? Isn't it Vahi bin Soah Aaron? You remember, I mean, you know, the, the, there are two mitzvot in Parashat Truma. Because all the other mitzvot in Parashat Truma are, 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 are um, uh, unique to the time of the building, but they're not Lidorot, as the Rambam says. But one of them is that you're not allowed to remove the, the poles from the Aaron. And one way to understand that is that the Aaron is always set for motion. The Torah is always in motion, which is what Torah in motion, I imagine, is partly about, partially about. If we don't change, if we don't develop, if we don't grow and move with, with the direction in which the world that God created is going, then we've given up. The Ramchal points this out, by the way, in his Derech Hashem. As a matter of fact, he writes this in two places. He writes it more, more predominantly in uh, the Mesila Yisharim. I don't know that you know, but there are two versions of the Mesila Yisharim. The most famous version is the version written in chapter form, but there is another version that is written in dialogue form. It's printed by Machon Ofek. If you haven't seen it, then you should look it up. Printed by Machon Ofek. And it, for all intents and purposes, is identical, but there are two major things that are different about it. First of all, the one thing that is unique to the, to the dialogue version, it's the only version of the Mesilat Yesharim that we have by the Ktav Yad of the Ramchal. So we know that the Ramchal wrote that, right? The Ramchal's Ktav Yad is written in the dialogue version. And the difference between the dialogue version and the chapter version is this vast introduction that he has. Which is a which is a which is a, a discussion between a chacham and a chassid, and in that discussion he points out that you know we don't really need history if the whole goal of the world is that God should put us into this world in order to gain merit, then you know you put in the basic uh, ramifications that a person needs for that and you go about your day you know you go about your life and you get whatever merit you get and whatever failures you get and then we tally it up, tally it up at the end and you continue. What do you need history for that? Why does the world need to change and develop for something like that? Obviously, there's got to be more to it. So yes, agreed. Um, in some ways, librarians by the 20th century, largely women, were at the pinnacle of religious secular education. It's true. It's not a, not a bad point. Thank you for pointing that out. Google suggests we mentioned that uh, comment by Tova. Thank you. Google isn't uh, responsible for the overemphasis on the self-identity politics and the view that only victims hold the ethical high ground is to blame. Well, thank you for that. I don't think that anything is uh, solely responsible. I think that it is a conglomerate of responsibilities, Google not being in any way a small aspect of it. That's for another time, though. I don't think we have a great deal of time now to be able to unpack all of that. But Rabbi Kelman, I would be happy to talk about that on its own at some point, if you wish. Um, Rabbi Uri was our Rav in young Israel. You were very lucky, Grace. 
He was a great Talmud Chacham, very special man. That is a fascinating insight about Chama Badia. Ah, thank you, Mel. Being from Amsterdam, we in fact primarily associate Sephardi with Spanish Portuguese. Indeed, you would. I imagine so. Yeah, it's one of the rare places. As a matter of fact, the Chacham Tzvi was uh, the Rav in Amsterdam for some time in his life, and he writes about the Sephardim. He was one of the very few people at the time who saw out clearly, you know, what the Sephardim were doing. He's right next door. And he writes, for example, you know, this, he writes about Shabbat Chazon, the Chacham Tzvi. Shabbat Chazon is Shabbat before Tisha B'Av. And the minhag of the Ashkenazim in Amsterdam was, and other Ashkenazi communities, was that they didn't dress in, in, in Big Day Shabbat on Shabbat Chazon, and they read Kinot, or they read at least in the tunes of the Kinot on Shabbat, and the Chacham Tzvi said that he felt it was absolutely inappropriate to do that, and that if he had the ability, he would change the minhag of the Sfaradim that were next door, that sang Shabbat regular, that treated Shabbat Chazon as a regular Shabbat, because Shabbat takes precedence over all of it. This as an example, he also said, the Chams, we also said that if he had the ability, he would do away with Kitniot on Pesach. But, uh, and the reason he said that, by the way, Chamsvi, which the, his son, the Yabitz, uh, wrote, is because he was worried, he was concerned that because of the minhag of Kitniot on Pesach, the compensation for not having Kitniot was that people baked more matzah. And he said that the ma baking more matzah makes, I mean, at the time, in Amsterdam at the time, well, obviously our days, we deal with it differently, but at the time, they just made more matzah because what are you going to eat uh, if you don't have the kitniot? And he said that that's the most dangerous thing in the world because the most dangerous thing that we eat on Pesach is matzah, mm -hmm. obviously. You can't make matzah with something that's not going to become chametz. It has to potentially become chametz in order for it to be matzah. If it can't become chametz, it can't be matzah. And so if it's if it, you're baking matzah, you're always walking the line. That's what always is so funny to me, I have to say, incidentally. I mean, we go crazy to make sure that we stay away from chametz on Pesach, which we should, which we should. I'm not saying we shouldn't. But yet the matzah, you know, the matzah is the most dangerous, cutting-edge thing that we eat on Pesach. And so the, the chametz was worried that if we were going to be making more matzah, we'd become more lax in the baking of the matzah, and then we would run the risk of actually having chametz tikka matzah. Don't tell anybody that I said chametz tikka. I always find as an Ashkenazi Jew who has gone through the Jewish system, how ignorant I am about Sephardi history. I think that's something that we all share. I myself included. It's taken me a great deal of time to learn about my own culture. Thank you, Grace. Rabbi Nieto was kept down by the board of deputies of the time. He's actually quite famous and I've quoted him. Things haven't changed much in the UK, <laughs> Irene. Well, I mean, you know, that might very well be. But remember that the Board of Deputies was, was uh, not around at the time of Ham David Nieto, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Sir Moses Montefiore was one of the founders of the Board of Deputies, and that was a little bit later in, in time. But uh, the, the, there was some you know, politics around, around, the, around that time. It's funny because when I became senior rabbi, um, I met with Rabbi Sachs, one of the first meetings I had with him, and he said, you know, Rabbi Dweck, together with the chief rabbi, you are the ecclesiastical authority to the board of deputies. And I said, what does that mean? He said, I have no idea, <laughs> but that's, it's a grandfathered position. It comes with the role. Uh, um, but no. me, it was founded in 1760, the board of deputies. It right. might have been and, correct. Different. And Hacham Davi was 1701. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, they put they put down his views. I'm not getting ah, you. his views. Okay, forgive me. Yes, yes, forgive, yes. Me, forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive um, me. From Jules and Carla Sulzbach. Excuse me if I didn't pronounce that correctly. Rabbi Dweck, are you related to Professor Yaakov Dweck? No, I'm not. I am not. But it was a superb study on Ham Yaakov's Sportas. Superb study. Um, yes, he is still in the band. Uh, yes, indeed. Rabbi Angel wrote. Yes, he did. Right. Yeah. Okay, we'll talk about the Ramchal another time, but B, I would love to hear whatever it is that you have uh, on that, in terms of that. The Italian community, not a very traditional by itself. Depends where in Italy. Depends where in Italy. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There is my honor. Mm, let's see. Yeah, agreed about the Maghreb. It states the name Luzata was an Italian version of the German name Lausitz. Okay, you're talking about origins, which is derived from Lausitz. I, I hear, I hear, origin. But his engagement was, again, uh, we don't want to get into the argument now, but he writes, for example, Pirushim on the Tifilot, and his liturgy is, is clearly in the uh, the classic Sfaradi uh, approach. The recording of his talk be available. I don't know about the recordings. Toda, you combine us, Rosmo Zahmarav. Well, that's my life. 
Tova, really. I find myself to be kind of a combination of Mizrahi and Arab, so I appreciate that. Um, lovely. Okay. I think we're going to end there. Are there any, I don't know if there are any other questions, but we're, we're, we're at the time. So Rabbi Kelman, I, I hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Really very, as you see all the comments, very fascinating lecture. I've already gotten some private requests to ask you to come back after the series. It was my uh, honor. The, uh, really, Bakasha, really very, very interesting. And uh, thank you very much for that. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Same time on the Torrent Motion, the Eating Channel. Uh, tonight, Mark Shapiro continues his series on his book. Tomorrow morning, Yoel Finkelman will be giving a talk, an introduction to, to Hebrew manuscripts. He's the uh, senior, he works in, in the National Library in Yerushalayim. So everybody's welcome, 11 o'clock. Then to heal him uh, with Benny Gesundheit at 12.15. Wednesday morning, Marty Lakshin talking about on Spinoza, not quite the same, but Marty Lakshin talking about biblical commentaries they never taught you in yeshiva, on Shadal Mendelssohn and Rav David Tzvi Hoffman, um, a six-week like, you know, series. Wednesday night, we begin our weekly shir on the Haftorah. Um, every week, the Haftorah is sort of, I think, a unique and unusual, and I think uh, well worthwhile. And Moshe Sokolov is a wonderful teacher, those of you who heard him during our Tanakh series. And um, Thursday, Shuli Miskin on archaeology, a four-part series on archaeology in the land of Israel and our Parsha Shir at night. So uh, we look forward to seeing you, all of you, and uh, everybody be well. Have a wonderful day. Let your friends know about it. And we look forward to learning with you together on uh, the Tarmotion E-Team chan Zoom channel. Okay.